true Christian's relationship with politics? Very, very interesting question. Because it's very evident, isn't it, that the political machine has many different people obviously involved in it, and also we know has a lot of Christians that are involved in politics. But I just want to put this quote up because I found this very interesting and it sort of summarises where we are as a community and then I want to, if you like, defend that um, from the Bible as we move forward. This is from Henry Sully in a uh, Bible magazine called the Christadelphia Magazine, 1919, so about 103 years ago. It was just after the Great War. And he wrote this, which is very interesting. He said, Christadelphians are separate from all other religious communities and do not take part in the politics of the world. They are now publicly recognised as a people who are separate in this respect and in their religious views and aims distinguished from all other religious people who take part in the politics of the world. This separation, required by apostolic injunction in 2 Corinthians 6 and 1 John 2, which we'll have a look at, has not been mentioned by Christians. And sort of end of the quote there. So that's kind of interesting. That sets the stage. That sets where we are as a community in relation to politics, that we take, do not take part in the politics of this world. So we want to discuss that and why we have that unusual position amongst the Christ Christian community. And so just a definition, um, and what we will be using as this term politics is obviously on the, the global and, the, and the, the national scale. We're not talking about internal politics that you might hear about in workplaces or something like that. Um, we're talking about here on a national and a state sort of scale, which is that the definition is by Cambridge Dictionary, the activities of the government, members of lawmaking organisations or people who try to influence the way a country is governed. Um, the job of holding a position of power in the government and the activities that relate to influencing the actions and policies of a government or getting and keeping power in a government. So I think that's pretty clear. We, we understand the idea of politics and all that's entailed in that, the whole machination of government and politics. So what relation does a true Christian have with that? And I've, we've used the title very carefully, True Christian, and what we want to do with that is go back to what Christ himself taught his very first disciples. So we're talking first century Christianity, as we have here in our Bible. What was it that Christ instructed them on their relationship to the state? And so that's by definition why we've got it there, rather than just having the word Christian, because Christian can incorporate a whole vast different spectrum of different beliefs that come under that sort of banner. So we're trying to go back to the Word of God as we do for all of our talks on any Bible subject to the Word of God to sort of discuss that. But it is very clear that Christians do have a big part, just like other groups, a big part in politics. Here's a, a Christian Democrat party that was actually going since 1977 and actually only just folded um, in March this year. Um, due to it not meeting membership number requirements. So that's folded. That was the uh, Christian Democrat Party. So that was uh, not only a political party that had Christianity involved in it, it actually labelled it on its heading. This is a Christian party. All right. We have another party, though, um, that's sort of risen with the demise of that one. This started in 2011, called the Australian Christians, um, run by Protestant Christians that appear to offer something from their Christian background that's going to be helpful to the country. And on the surface, it is actually, sounds good. Think, well, you've got something to share. You've got principles and ethics. Why not share them with the greater community and make that the stamp of the nation? And so you probably can't probably read that very well, but that's there sort of on their web, web page, just a cut and paste of their basic um, mantras that they have as coming to it. So I guess one of them, it, or I'll read it out for you because you can't read it there. They, they would not, uh, sorry, it's got there, number one, they would vote not just because they are obliged to, but because they want to honour God and contribute to the well-being of their fellow citizens. That's what's saying that we should do. And that this group, that they would seek to be well informed about candidates before election day and consult Christian websites, not just secular media. They would not hesitate to declare their support for Christian values at the ballot box in any way they can, through their vote and practical support 
of Christian candidates, etc. And that they would pray that God's righteousness, justice, compassion and wisdom may be evident in the laws of our nation through the people we elect to Parliament. So it sounds good, doesn't it? And that they will consider their democratic vote a privilege and responsibility and make an informed decision about the future of their nation. So we can see where it's heading. It's saying, let's have a party where we're going to get values from the Bible, from our Christian background, and make them part of the nation and the national sort of flavour that's going to help create a better world. All right? And to a certain point of, agree, we, point of view, we agree with that, the sentiments of that. But is it true that a true Christian can have this sort of relationship with the politics of this world? And that's what we want to discuss. We want to look later actually at the history of how did this intertwining of Christianity and politics actually start. Um, but first, let's just sweep away all what they might say and, and everything else and surmises and actually just go to the Bible and look at what the Bible says about true Christianity and the politics of this world. So we first want to do under a few, a few subheadings. Um, the first one is that the Bible very clearly speaks about two different entities in the world, the truth and the world. So if we go to these two quotes, John 17 first. So this is Christ himself, the founder of Christianity. John 17, and see what he says about the true believer and their relationship to the state. John chapter 17 it's this prayer that Jesus makes in the garden just before he's actually taken and crucified. A very passionate prayer. And it's not all about himself, it's about his disciples, very typical of Christ. It's not about himself, it's about his believers, his disciples. So it's all about that. And so we're right on the subject where he's there speaking from his heart to God about his followers and their relationship with the world. And so just coming in then at verse 14 to 20, where he says... I have given them, verse that is the disciples, thy word. He's given them your word, God's word. And the world, there's another entity that he brings into play, the world hath hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So Christ and his followers line up under a different banner to the world at large, the world politic at large. Very clear. And he says, I pray not that thou, God, should take them out of the world. Don't sort of rescue them from the world and take them some, somewhere else. All right. But that you should keep them from the evil of the world. That's his prayer to God for his disciples. He said, and he reiterates it again. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And he says, sanctify them. Make them holy. Make them separate to you, God. Sanctify them. How? Through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So there's this thing about truth that he puts in opposition to the world at large. And he wants them to be sanctified through that truth. And how, do they, how does that happen? Through God's word. Thy word is truth. All right? So if we want to know what the truth in any subject is, we go to the Bible. And we're, we're always very clear on that whenever we, we raise a subject here at this meeting. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So Christ had to go into the world to do something, to address the problem of sin and to bring in righteousness and everlasting salvation. And he's saying that's why I'm actually sending them into the world. So we can start to get a reason that he's giving why he doesn't want God to take them out and put them in a nice little insular spot somewhere. They actually got to be in the world for a purpose. And that purpose is to actually preach Christ, preach the truth, as opposed to the world. Okay? And that's what he says in verse 19. And for their sakes, therefore, for my disciples' sake, I sanctify myself. And that was going to include his death on the cross. That they also might be sanctified through thy truth. So I've gone very slowly through that because I think that's very, very key to our subject tonight. That there are two separate, in Christ's mind, there's two separate entities out there. There's the world and there's truth. And they don't mix. He says, yes, they've got to be part of it, but that's only to demonstrate the truth to the world. 
That's, that's their job, just as it was my job, he says. So that, that, I think, is a very good foundation for us to sort of work on when it comes to the politics of this world and whether we get involved in that. John chapter 3 is another one. John 3, verse 16, is a very, very famous quote. But we're going to go on a little bit from that and find out there's a little bit more to it than just verse 16. Where he is speaking here, where he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God gave his Son that people that come and believe in him actually can have everlasting life. Very clear. And it shows the wonder of God in verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world. So we've, all the way through you've got the world. The world. And we're not just talking about the green planet. Okay? With blue for oceans. We're talking about the world of the people. We're talking about people generally upon the face of the earth. And God sent not his son into that world to condemn it. To condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. So God's eternal purpose is that... He wants as many as possible to come and believe on his son. And that's why he sent him, why Christ was then going to send his disciples into the world. Verse 18. He that believeth on him, on Christ, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So it doesn't work for you if you don't believe, <laughs> it is what God is saying. He wants to save all. But we have to believe in truth, in his son. And verse 19 is very telling. It says, and this is the condemnation. So if we want to say this is what the condemnation of the world is, it's this. That light is come into the world. And by that he means truth. All right, through John, light equals truth equals the gospel. All right? So that light is come into the world. But the trouble is men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And so we've got this, once again, this fight. We've got, we talked about the world and truth in John 17. Now we're talking about light and darkness. And it's saying that the problem with the majority of mankind is they love darkness because their deeds are evil. They're not, they don't want to do what God actually says in his word. What truth upholds in the word of God is something they don't want because they're enjoying themselves doing works of darkness, as the Bible would call it. But there is that open invitation that God has for all to come to the light. But it does have that sad note that, yes, a lot of mankind likes to hide in darkness. And verse 21, But he that doeth truth, this is a positive, he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest or shown, that they are wrought in God. So as he's going to come to truth, see light, do works that are going to show, not that he's wonderful, but that he's learned of God and that he's starting to display what God wants. So two, I think, very good quotes to show this underlying fundamental um, point I'm trying to make about the two entities that are out there. And already you're starting to see, well, how does that then work if we are involved in the machinations of worldly government and policies. However much good we might want to be bringing to the table of that, how can we be involved in that? And sort of on a, the same theme but a different image to give the idea is this idea in the Bible that calls of being unequally yoked. So if we go to 2 Corinthians, so, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and then chapter 6, and verse 14 to 18. So it's based obviously upon familiar objects that they saw every day. We don't see them quite as much today. We don't normally go down into the Adelaide Hills and see two oxen that are yoked together with a big yoke over them and they're pulling the plough. That doesn't happen anymore. We have tractors. But back then, this was the idea that people commonly saw of animals yoked together to give them more strength, obviously, than one animal, and they'd be going in the same direction together and ploughing the field. 
So that's the image that he picks up in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So Paul says to the believers there, he says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath, here's the same image again, light with darkness? And he says, what concord, what, what agreement has Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, with an unbeliever? And he says, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols, foreign gods? He says, for ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, quotes from where God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So he's saying God actually wants to walk in you. He wants to be with you and actually be seen in the actions that you do. So as you're doing your daily life, people are seeing what God would do. Now, we do that incredibly imperfectly and that's certainly um, our human nature that comes to the fore. But God's saying, I want to work with you however frail you are and however faulty you are, that's what I want to be trying to work with you and, and do. And he says, you're not going to help. You cannot do that if you're unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So in other words, if you have this yoke and you imagine it, a sort of, a, you know, a tiny little donkey and then a massive big ox with this sort of yoke between them and they're trying to both pull this plough in the field, it's just not going to work, is it? it just, it's unequally yoked. You need to have two oxen about the same sort of size and get the yoke across them and then it goes forward. All right? It just doesn't work if you've got completely different animals or whatever. Pulling, they're going to be pulling completely wrong and in, the, and in the wrong direction to each other. And so it's not going to be work. So he gives that image and saying, well, it never happens in nature. We don't do that because it doesn't work. So he says, it's not going to work in your life as a believer either. If you are doing this, if you're having this relationship with unbelievers, and this can give lots of different layers to what this relationship is with unbelievers. All right. But here he says, what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and communion has light with darkness. So once again, we come back to the question, how can a true believer have a political relationship with a political party of this world? Okay, and on that score, First John 2, this was one of the ones that Henry Sully mentioned in that opening um, little preface, preface that I quoted. First John chapter 2. Verse 15 and 16. And once again, you'll see the word world come out again. So 1 to John, not, not the Gospel of John. 1 to John is a letter of John sort of hidden in the back there near Revelation. 1 to John and chapter 2 and verses 15 and 16. Where he's very, very clear to the disciples. He's writing this letter to his fellow believers and he says this to them. Verse 15, love not the world. Once again, it's that word, the world, and all that that means to the believers. That is, outside of the truth, those things of the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lusts thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So he sees there's something temporal. In the big picture of things, it's still here, and it's here, been here all the way from John's day. But in the big scheme of God's plan, that is a temporal thing. Temporal thing of the world and all of its lusts that rule mankind, generally speaking. And he says, don't love that. Don't go after that and don't entertain these lusts that are common to mankind. And we could take you back to, to Genesis in the very beginning with Adam and Eve and show that those three lusts were what actually tempted them to sin in the beginning. And it's been like that ever since. That these lusts tempt mankind to not follow the ways of God. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Particularly pride of life there is a, is a massive one. And particularly when it comes into politics as well, which I probably don't need to explain that to you. All right, so there's this idea of being unequally yoked. And once again, 
the idea of not loving the things of this world because we would be definitely unequally yoked if we did so. So another subheading, we're sort of working our way through the subject, trying to get a platform for it from the scriptures of why we don't believe we can have a relationship with politics. And that's the idea of the life of the Christian. What's it meant to look like? So this is Christ speaking to his first century believers in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to make, hang around Matthew 5 and 6. We could go plenty of other places, but this was his famous Sermon on the Mount. And he says a lot of things about what a believer's life should look like. And we're only going to just pick out just a few things to illustrate the point. There's three chapters here, Matthew 5 to 7, is the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, plus there's a whole lot of other things that we could bring in as well. But we're just going to limit our talk tonight to a few things just to give you the idea and flavour of why we believe that Christ, in instructing his disciples, therefore makes it impossible for us to be involved in politics. So Matthew 5 and verses 1 to 12, we know the blessed, the Beatitudes that are said here. Where he says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... So he's talking to his disciples, talking to their heart and saying, this is what you really need to be like to be my disciples. So he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And so one big factor out of that is that this blessing is given. Blessed or happy is, is said to be those people that are meek, that thirst after righteousness. And after all of them, it's for something shall happen. It's not going to be an immediate reward is, is a key point I want to make from all of these blessings. It's something for a future age that is to come. And we'll discuss that with the kingdom of God later on. And so there's a blessing upon the disciples now because of the way that they respond to the word of God and show it in their life because of a blessing, not that's going to come upon them now in any, um, in any great um, way in this life, but that is going to be a future award for them. That's very evident from what he writes here. And just picking out a couple of them and trying to think this through if you're going to have a hand or be involved in the political government where it says to the likes in verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's teaching Christ that they will inherit the earth. Those that are meek, those that don't um, aggrandise themselves, to push themselves forward, okay, but meekly are instructed by the word of God and live a life in meekness before him. But it certainly is not true that the meek will inherit Parliament House. It just doesn't happen. Okay? To be in the political sphere, one cannot be meek. All right, So there's just something to think about there. And somebody that's hungering and thirsting after righteousness, it's what they want. Okay, and, Or, verse 8, the pure in heart. How does that tie in? No matter how much good we might want to bring to the political agenda, how much would we have to accept of what we cannot agree with on the political sphere? And there's many, many areas that are now contravene quite clearly what the Bible says on certain topics that we'd find completely unworkable with that of a true Christian. And so we have this great dilemma there that we would be compromising ourselves each and every day um, if we trying to model ourselves after what Christ says here. But we want to go on in Matthew 5, verse 38 and 48, just jumping ahead, and there's other things we could deal with here, but... Just verse 38 to 48, 
where he says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Wow. How would that work in politics? Have another go, you know. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. So it's, it's preaching a gospel of non-resistance to evil. Right? Very powerful and very hard to show in our life. And natural inclination, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, wants to have its revenge upon anybody that will have a go at us and wants to get even and wants to, wants to hurt or maim those that might hurt or maim them. And yet it says here, uh, verse 41, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. Go the extra mile. That's what we get in our language. Go the extra mile for somebody that's, and in that case it used to be Roman soldiers that would make you, back then in, in Matthew's day, make you actually take something for them. They would, they would grab you from the street and say, oh, you have to carry this for me. And there was an injunction that said they weren't actually allowed to ask a person to do more than one mile. That's still a long way. Whereas he's saying, well, you get asked to do that. Go happily another with them. Show them that you've got a completely different spirit. That you, it's not all about you, okay? That you're trying to show the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of these things that we're reading about, he perfectly showed in his life. He's not here preaching to people, saying you should do this, and he did nothing like it. He lived this every day in his life. Um, verse 42. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. How would that go at the moment? If you're involved in a war. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So it's a completely different world view that a Christian, true Christian has. He's not looking at this present life and this present get that he can get now or this you know, attitude that he feels innate in him to sort of vent on somebody else. He's showing the qualities of Christ and of God and looking forward to a better day, a day when all those things will be sorted out and there'll be a wonderful time in the kingdom of God. That's what he's looking forward to. And so for these other things are just temporal matters and he, he can let them go by. And in doing so, people look at that and go, why has he just done that? That's a completely different attitude to what I would have showed. Why has he done that? What store does he take on the present possessions of this world, etc.? So just relating that, I guess, to politics and to the likes of being part of a political party or helping or aiding a political party... How do those sort of qualities go with that? And I just ask you maybe to think about that. Um, and the other one is Matthew 6, and we're talking about billboards and things. Matthew 6 and verse 1. But you're putting yourself up there, aren't you? <laughs> you're, you are putting yourself up there to say, vote for me or vote for this party, vote for my party. Go around and try to get votes for your party and put your ideas forward. And it says here, take heed, verse 6, verse 1, that you do not your arms before men. Now, that idea of doing arms is doing a righteousness, doing, doing good works, okay? Good things, giving money, doing whatever it might be, good things, um, starting a hospital up, whatever it might be. Doing those good things before men, take heed that you don't do it before men. In other words, to be seen of men. Otherwise, you shall have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. So it says in verse 2, do those things quietly. If you're doing good works, yes, you are, because you're trying to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, but don't make sure that everybody knows about it, okay? That those things are just seen between you and God and that you've quietly been trying to do what God would have. Well, <laughs> that doesn't work with politics. You have to have a tick box of all the things that you've done, of all the things that you've achieved in your office, of all the good things that you can point to to say, I'm a wonderful person, please vote for me. So that's just another thought. You think, well, how could you do that and live the life of Christ in that sort of sphere? And just going back then to chapter 5 and verse 13, after those um, beatitudes or the blessings, he then says to them, you, the disciples, are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is then so it's good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. 
And so he says, you're, if you like, a preserving agent. You're, you are in this world showing the qualities that God wants to be seen forever. You're showing the qualities that God wants to have live on and on and on. Because sin and, and all the entrapments of sin cannot live on in harmony with God forever. God has decreed that cannot happen. And so what you are, like the salt of the earth, and showing the preserving qualities of the word of God in your life that God is wanting to see forever. But if that's been watered down and it's been mucked around with and that salt now has charcoal in it and it's just been completely um, made rancid, it's no good for anything. It, the salt has only got that one virtue and that is to preserve things and to make things um, taste and have the taste in it and for people to say, yes, that's the truth. But if that's been washed out and sort of made to just be diluted down because, well, we've got to just sort of live with these policies and that policy and this particular thing, even though I don't maybe particularly agree with it, the salt has lost its savour. So for all the good that might be seen to be done, no longer there is the truth defined. Light, darkness, truth, or the unequally yoked has just completely rendered what we're trying to do null and void. So that's sort of something to think about as well. But what we want to go on <clears throat> is say, well, what does he preach in the New Testament about a Christian's place in the current world? Current world that we have, what are we there to do? So we, if we're not to take part in politics of this world, what's our position on this planet? Um, and so if we go to Hebrews chapter 11, it's a, a famous chapter about faithful people in the Bible. So it's a good one to look at and think, okay, what makes these people faithful to God and that he's pleased with them? Hebrews chapter 11. It's a big chapter on faith. Because as we've seen already, what we believe in is not something that we're going to get here and now and not something they're going to be rewarded with straight away. It's a faith in something to come. And that's what he then says. After giving a few examples, we're just going to dive into chapter, uh, verse 13 and have a look at that. Verse 13 through to verse 16, where it says, talks about all these faithful people. That it then gives them this caption. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. So there were promises that they latched hold of. They never received them. But they've seen them afar off. Having seen them afar off, and they were persuaded of them. They had faith in them. They embraced them. And they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So the net result of them believing and embracing the promises was that, the corollary of that was that they said, as a result of that, I'm a stranger and a pilgrim in the earth. Why? For they that say these such things declare plainly, verse 14, that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. So they, they could have gone back to their old way of life, is really what it's saying. Abraham left Ur behind on all the trappings of that great city to do what God wanted him to do. He could have gone back if he wanted to, but no, he had faith in God that something better was ahead, even though he died in the faith of that, never receiving it. Okay? But where it says, verse 16, But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, whereof God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And so we have them looking forward to an age that was going to be from heaven, that God was going to organise. It's going to be upon the earth. We're going to look at that. Kingdom of God is going to be upon the earth, but it's going to be of a heavenly origin that God is going to set up upon the earth. And that's what they wanted. They wanted a place that was actually going to operate under heaven's rules and not under the rules of mankind, of the world, of darkness, of all those sort of things. So that was what they were looking for. And that's the Christian's place in, in our world is that we even though I was born a citizen of Australia, that coming into the Lord Jesus Christ, that truly my citizenship is of God, of heaven. And that's where my focus should be in this life. And Ephesians 2, it's got another one that sort of shows it from the opposite point of view. Ephesians 2, where he says, he looks back and says, actually, what were you like before the time that you actually believed? For the time you came in and became a believer in the truth, what were you like when it comes to the kingdom of God and all the wonderful things that are ahead with what God's going to put on the earth? What were you like at that time in relation to that? So you were in the world and 
light and kingdom was over there, if you like. What were you like in relationship to that wonderful time ahead? And Hebrews chapter, Ephesians 2 verse 12 says that at that time, time before you were in Christ, you were without Christ. So that's one thing. You didn't have the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. All right? Sounds a bit of a quaint expression. All right? But you were not citizens is the idea of that. You weren't citizens from the, of the commonwealth of Israel and all that that means. And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's pretty powerful. So he's saying to them, just think about it, how you were before you came to Christ in relation to what's going to come. You were actually divorced from that completely. You, had, you weren't part of what's going to be in the kingdom. So therefore the corollary is now true. If we're sort of standing over here, we're now in Christ and we're true Christians and we're standing in hope of the kingdom to come, we therefore look back on the world and go, well, actually, we're now aliens from that. We're now strangers from those things that were therefore part of everyday life then and the politics of this world. Is no longer what our focus in life is and what we're involved in. However, does that mean that we don't have anything to do? We don't need to pay our taxes? We don't need to, to pay our registration for the car? We don't need to do all these sorts of things? Of course not. We act as true Christians. We act as good law-abiding subjects in our current situation. If we go to Romans 13, our reading for tonight... Romans 13, I actually like the version Stephen had. They actually put it better than what I've got in the King James here. But that was, that was good. But it's, it's very, very, very clear. Writing, so this is Paul, great apostle Paul, writing to the Romans. He's very clear upon how we should act towards the governments of this world. And we certainly do not despise, and this is what he makes very clear, despise the governments that God has ordained to guide and direct our nations. So it says, let every soul, every person be subject unto the higher powers, those powers that are above us that are there to guide us in the nation. For there is no power, he says, but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And we'll look at that again a bit later on in Daniel, where there is actually, God has actually made the powers that exist to be over us. So he says, God's actually ordained that we have a government here in Australia, and this is how it's run. He says, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, the power of that government, resists the ordinance of God. So we actually treat them, we, we obey them as unto God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves condemnation. For he says, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise. Are the same. And generally speaking, that is true. There was obviously time in Nero's government where it wasn't so true when we have evil rulers that actually persecuted the Christians for their own ends. But by and large, what he's saying here is correct, that we actually have a government, if it's a stable government, it's going to be there for the good and trying to administer things as best they can for the good of the people. So he says, don't resist that, but actually obey that. For he is a minister, verse 4, to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, or avenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but for conscience' sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually unto this very thing. Render therefore to their, all their Jews tribute, custom, fear, fear and honour, is what we meant to show them. And so what we have there is, is very, very clear instruction from the Apostle Paul about, yes, okay, you might be strangers and pilgrims in the earth, but how do you actually act? and relate to the governments of the age that you happen to be under. Just as Abraham was very courteous with those um, that he came and, like say, wanted to buy a parcel of ground when he was a stranger and pilgrim in the land of Palestine, he, he very courteously arranged to buy a parcel of ground from the people that were there at the time so he could bury his wife. Those sort of things are what's found as a Christian in this age, that we're very respectful for the laws of this government. Um, the one exception to that... I've got, a, oh, sorry, I've got a similar quote in 1 Peter chapter 2. And 1 Peter 2 is very interesting because it is actually in the time when there was persecution heating up from Nero himself um, who, against the Christians. So it's actually very challenging actually for him to write this as a Christian. 
1 Peter chapter 2. So still on the similar theme to Romans 13, 1 Peter 2 and verses 11 to 14. Uh, where it says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from the fleshly lusts which war against your soul. That's those lusts we were talking about earlier. Don't have anything to do with them. Abstain from those things. Have your conversation, your way of life, honest among the Gentiles, those people that are not Jews, or that are, in this case it's talking about people that are not believers, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So there's quite clear instruction once again about how we are to relate to the governments of this world. There is uh, one exception. If we go to Acts 4, there is a caveat to that, which is where any instruction by a government will then make us break the law of God. And Peter and John were disciples and they were faced with that exact thing where the law was trying to make them do something that was going to be against their conscience. And so we do have this caveat, if you like, on, the, on obeying everything that the government says. If, if, if there is things in there which are against our conscience then God comes first. And so just go to Acts 4, verse 18 to 21, where it says, They called them, Peter and John, unto them. This is the big council that had met to tell them off, to make sure they don't do this again. This is called unto them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. So they weren't allowed to preach Jesus anymore. All right? How are they going to cope with that? Say, oh, well, you're the law of the land, so we'll do what you say. All right? In this particular case, they couldn't. In verse 19, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. You think about it. Shall we be beholden to you or to God? What's more important? He says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And if we just go over to chapter 5, and once again, 5 verse 28 and 29, the same thing then came up again. Where they actually said, they brought it up again. They said, didn't we straightly, verse 28 of chapter 5, did not we straightly, didn't we direct you, directly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter said, and the other apostles answered and said, so they all said as one, they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And that's, a, if you like, the injunction that says, God comes first in our relationship. If, if, if there's a difference between the laws of the land and the laws of God, then our conscience dictate we have to follow the ways of God. Well, what about voting? We're not involved in a political party as such. You know, we've got to weigh up when it comes to voting what we put in the ballot box. How, what happens then? Well, taking sides in voting... I believe to be impossible for Christians for two reasons. And that is that agreeing with one or other political party, whatever party we give our vote for, have policies in it, have, have platforms in it that we just cannot entertain. Right? No matter how much good there might be in their policies and the majority of it might be absolutely fine, there will be things in there that we cannot stick our hand up and say, yes, we vote for those people. All right. Later on we'll talk about the fact of we vote for the Lord Jesus Christ and wait for him to come. But that, that's just one point. The other point is probably more particular and more poignant really. If we go to Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17, we've actually already touched on it because it talks about the powers that be are ordained of God. Remember that one? So God's actually ordained those powers. That was in uh, uh, Romans 13. The powers that be are ordained of God. So God set powers in place for a particular reason, to bring about, ultimately, his purpose with the earth. So here's what, what that passage is showing us is in Romans 13 is that God has control of, the different, of who gets into government. All right? So Daniel chapter 4, very clear, and verse 17. And certainly the reason why I cannot actually vote for one party or the other. Daniel 4, verse 17, 
where it talks about this vision that's happened, the tree's been chopped down, and it's talking, it's a, I can discuss it afterwards, it's just a political thing, what's going to happen to Babylon, okay? But anyway, it says, verse 17, this matter, what we don't need to talk about at the moment, is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the Holy One. This is the bit I want us to, to get. To the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he wills and setteth up over it the basest of men. So there was a vision given about a tree that got chopped down and things happened and whatever, and it was talking about the fact that for a short time for Babylon was going to be chopped down, etc. In other words, God had control of what was going to happen to the great kingdom of Babylon. And he says, this actually shows us then, God says, that the living, people that are alive, might know that actually God, the Most High, rules in the kingdoms of men. So even though these kings, great Nebuchadnezzar or the like, think that they are in charge of their own destiny, they're not. God is above that and he is dictating what happens on the planet. He is dictating what happens to nations. And God gives it to whomsoever he wills. So God's not putting people in place necessarily because they're wonderful people. But he's putting them in place because it's his will that they're there because of what's going to play out in world history that he already knows is going to happen, which is pretty mind-blowing. But God knows the end from the beginning. He knows... The kingdom of God is going to be there and he knows all the steps are going to lead up to that wonderful time. And he knows what has to be in play so that that will actually come about. So the great prophecies that we do hear very often, Ezekiel 38, those sort of ones, Daniel chapter 2, can come to pass because God knows the end from the beginning and he's not just a guess at what might happen. God knows what will happen and he sets up over it. It says there, very interestingly, the basest of men. So that's why I can't vote, because I could look at all the different policies and go, well, actually, thinking with my Christian hat on, that I think these have probably got the best, most, uh, you know, Christian values than maybe this party here, so on balance I'll vote for them. Well, even if they were the best and most superlative party out there, it might not be the party that God wants in. And we might be found voting against what God wants. For example, who would have stuck their hand up and voted for Trump on the, on the uh, American election that when he got in to power. It was a complete bombshell. People were like, how on earth did he get in? And there's always analysis done afterwards, oh, this may be how it happened, why it happened. It's because the angels wanted that to happen. All right? And there's plenty of other political things that have happened, like the Brexit movement. I can talk to you about that afterwards, where things were actually, if you like, manipulated by the angels with the weather and all sorts of things to make sure that certain areas didn't get out and vote and stuff like that. So that certain things happened according to what God wanted to happen. And there's plenty of those sort of examples in history. So why was it that Hitler got in? Would we have wanted him to be in? Mussolini, Stalin, all those sort of people. But in God's ultimate knowledge, which we don't understand, those people had to be in to forward his purpose. And it will be 2020 hindsight where we'll be able to look at that, particularly from the kingdom's point of view, and standing in the kingdom and looking back and going, I can see exactly why that had to transpire that way. So to me, I feel completely at sea to even be able to think from a Christian point of view, how can I vote for one party or the other? Because it doesn't just come down to what might be the better or the worst party. What party does God want in for the fulfilment of his world plan and purpose that he has? So that's why I can't participate in voting. So why don't I make a big deal about it and why don't we just why don't why don't I or Chris Adelphians generally go just into a polling booth, get our name taken off, put in an informal vote, which means we basically put a blank bit of paper in, and it doesn't register one way or the other. It would amount to the same thing, wouldn't it, if we just did that, an informal vote. We would basically just be basically getting our name taken off. So we're not noticed by anybody. Nobody thinks well, you know, the government hasn't noticed that I haven't voted. But at the end of the day, I haven't actually swayed the vote one way or the other. Well, I would say from a couple of points of view, two points of view in my, in my opinion, is that why not have just honest transparency with the government of what, why we're not voting? Because what will happen is you'll get a, a, a letter through the mail to say, OK, you've got an apparent failure to vote. Uh, please explain yourself or pay the fine. All right? And we're very blessed in our country that we can have a conscience of conscience decision that we can then write back to them and say, look, it's actually a tenet, it's a belief of the Christadelphians of whom I'm a member, that we don't take any part in politics, therefore I did not vote. 
or something to that effect. You can have as many pages as you want, but effectively, at the end of the day, you're saying that because of my beliefs, I can't take any part in politics. All right? And isn't that a much better way? You're actually honestly trans like you're, you know, telling the government why you're not voting. Because actually, when I was researching this, you look it up, and there's, there's thousands of dollars, you're actually saving a lot of taxpayer money too, thousands of dollars spent on actually working out why people cast informal votes and why people get them wrong. And can they address those issues so that they can have a more representative vote from more people? That's what they want. So you're sort of circumventing that a bit and saying, well, actually, I'm giving you my reason why I'm not voting, rather than just going in and doing a, a dud vote. You're actually giving the government a reason that they know. There's another important, very important reason for this too, is that it sets a precedent as a true Christian on the fact that you actually have a conscience, like Peter and John stood up and said, actually, I've got to obey God rather than men, that when it comes to other more serious matters, particularly like conscientious objection to military service, that we therefore have a stand before the government to say, actually, we do have a conscience. We've shown that in the voting system. When it comes to war, we believe from what we read in the scriptures, we cannot take up arms. All right? And we're following first century tradition in that, and that we do have a strong conscience on that. On that. Um, just interesting to see a quote from Gibbon on that, actually, on the first century Christians. Uh, sorry, it's a bit of a read there. But it does show my point exactly about this idea of conscientious objection. And, the, and also the distance that, that the Christians had from the world at large. And I think you can get that when you read this, this article. It says, the Christians were not less adverse to the business, I've got in brackets, of war, this is what he's talking about, business of war, than of the pleasures of this world. The defence of our persons and property, they knew not how to reconcile with the patient doctrine which enjoined an unlimited forgiveness of past injuries and commanded them to invite the repetition of fresh insults. Got to think about that. It's, it was written in about 1770, this was, and translated. So, but basically he's saying that these people, either of their persons or property, they could not reconcile how they could defend themselves against what the commandments of Christ were. And they had to actually have fresh insults. If they came, they had to accept them. All right? Their simplicity was offended by the use of oaths, because Jesus said, you're not meant to swear, not meant to swear by oaths and say, you know, by the temple, by this, whatever. He just says, let your yes be yes and your nay be nay. So when it came to oaths, they didn't want that. They wanted the simplicity of just saying yes or no. So if they got adjured by an oath, they didn't want to take that. But it says, or by the pomp of magistry, magistry and by the active contention of public life. And that's really our voting sort of idea, politics of this world. They didn't have it. They eschewed that. They didn't have that active contention in public life, nor could their humane ignorance be convinced that it was lawful on any occasion to shed the blood of our fellow creatures, either by the sword of justice or by that of war, even though their criminal or hostile attempts should threaten the peace and safety of the whole community. So even if there was a war enjoined, they couldn't join it because of their allegiance to what Christ had said about taking up arms and killing fellow humans. So that, that was how Gibbon saw it, in his book on the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, of what the first century Christians actually acted like. And that's what we're trying to, um, trying to get to with uh, our reading of the Bible. How best can we model our Christianity on what first century Christianity was like? Well, how then did this strong bond with church and state emerge? And we, we have run out of time, so I'll say it very briefly that Constantine took Christianity from being a persecuted sect in about 308 years after Christ, and it was persecuted by the pagan emperors that, that came after Nero, sometimes more, sometimes less, particularly just before Constantine came to power with Diocletian. Constantine took it from being that persecuted minority to actually being the religion of government. Okay? He then endorsed Christianity and took it on. And then since then, there's been this... Christian, Christian uh, Roman world following the pagan Roman world. And that's how it came into government and they went from being uh, this persecuted sect to being one whereby they were actually making the laws and calling the shots. And it's just very, very interesting quote that as a result of that, this wonderful doctrine of the kingdom that I've been talking about, this time of, of the millennium of the thousand year reign of Christ, gradually dwindled 
in the minds of those believers because they had present, if you like, the kingdom of God to them became the present, the present church upon the earth. And that's what he basically goes on in Gibbon to say, where he says, the ancient and popular doctrine of the millennium was intimately connected with the second coming of Christ. We totally believe that. Though it might not be universally received, it appears to have been the reigning sentiment of the orthodox believers. And it seems so well adapted to the desires and apprehensions of mankind that it must have contributed in a very considerable degree to the progress of the Christian faith. And we say amen to that. But when the edifice of the church was almost completed, in other words, when it finally got to a position of power under Constantine, the temporary support, it saw then the, the, the millennium doctrine, doctrine of time of a better, a better time ahead as a temporary support to sort of get them through. That was laid aside. The doctrine of Christ's reign upon earth was at first treated as a profound allegory, was considered by degrees as doubtful and useless opinion, and was at length rejected as the absurd invention of heresy and fanaticism. A mysterious prophecy which still forms a part of the sacred canon, but which was thought to favour the exploded sentiment, has very narrowly escaped the prescription of the church. In other words, it almost got banned. It's, so what we then have is we have the kingdom of God is the church. It's not some time in the future. It is the here and now that we have established upon the earth. But it does lead to the important point of the talk as far as politics tonight. Because we do believe that there is a kingdom to come. We do believe that there has been a kingdom of God upon the earth and that there will be in the future. If I go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 6... that the kingdom of God to come is going to be a much greater and more perfect thing of, than what was actually the, the, of what was actually there prior in the time of the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament. Because that's what the disciples want to know. They say to Jesus before he ascends to heaven, he said, they say in verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They saw that that kingdom restored to Israel was none other than, at the end of verse 3, the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. They believed that things pertaining to the kingdom of God was a restored kingdom to Israel. And so all I want to say about that is that in the past, yes, there were kings and rulers and they were godly people. Why were they allowed to, if you like, take part in government then? And why can't Christians take part in government now? Is because that was actually the kingdom of God upon earth. It was a theocracy. It was God ruling over this nation of Israel. And he appointed kings and rulers to do that. So when God has appointed such and made such, there's perfectly, not only acceptable, but appropriate that there is godly people in the realms of government. And when they weren't, it's when the nation actually went bad. Um, and Jesus commands uh, Pilate, saying, my kingdom is not of this world. When he was getting arraigned before Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom was, was of this world. My servants would fight that I shouldn't be delivered. All right? And it was actually, interestingly enough, politics that actually was the final death knell to actually getting Christ crucified. Because the Jews then played their last card and they said to Pilate, says, if you don't give that man to us and kill him, you're not Caesar's friend. You're going to lose your position before Caesar if you don't do that. So for political expediency... Once the Jews then stuck their, stuck their hand up and said, we have no king but Caesar, which was completely un-Jewish, Pilate saw he wasn't going to get the best of it. And if he wanted to have his political skin, he had to give Jesus to be crucified. So that was just an interesting by the by. That it was a political um, thing that actually ended up finally leading to Christ being crucified. But the future is, is the bright spot. And Matthew 19, verse 28 Apologies for going a couple of minutes over. Matthew 19, verse 28. He's talking particularly to his 12 apostles who are going to get a, a very special role in the kingdom to come. But it also speaks about others, the disciples of Jesus, generally. Where it says in verse 28, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, speaking of the time of the kingdom, he says, Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken, everyone, not just those twelve, everyone, every one of us that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. 
So we've got this wonderful assurance of Christ there. And just quoting these because we haven't got time, Revelation 5 verse 10, it says in there that you have made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign upon the earth. And that last quote, Habakkuk 2.14, speaks about the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of God. So it speaks of a wonderful time coming when Christ will be king, when he will have his apostles ruling, he have other people ruling and helping to in the, in the realms of government over a world that is coming to grips with the aftermath of Armageddon. It's going to be a horrific time for the world and there's going to be a great change where then the kingdoms of men, the world, has been, has been silenced and when the kingdom of God is established as a ruling kingdom over the whole earth. So it is not quite true that a, a true Christian will have nothing to do with politics. But a more correct statement would be that we have nothing to do with the politics of this age. He, however, a Christian, however, has everything to do with the politics of the kingdom to come. And we invite you to join the party, the party that is the only government that will truly save our world, and to vote with our way of life for the king to come, the Lord Jesus Christ.